Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 2023rd Special Town Meeting Warrant Preview. I'm Vicki Geary, spokesperson for the League of Women Voters of Westford, uh, and I'm so glad you are able to attend this evening. The League of Women Voters of Westford is a nonpartisan, grassroots organization of people of all genders, ages, and backgrounds. The League's goals are to encourage active and informed participation, which is one of the reasons we're really glad we host these ty types of events, so to inform active participation in government, increase understanding of major public policy issues, and influence public policy through education and ad advocacy. The League does not, on any local, state, or national level, support any political candidates. Please go to our website, lwv.westford.org, to learn more. Our site also includes a series of short videos that explain various aspects of town meaning hosted by our lovely Angela Harkness here. These vi videos are also available on her town moderators page and are a great resource in learning about more about the workings of town meeting. Tonight, we have with us several town officials and petitioners that will explain the various articles uh, for Monday night's meeting and will answer any questions regarding the articles. We have with us Angela Harkness, our town moderator, Christina Last, our town manager, Dan O'Donnell, Finance Director, Jenny Lynn, Director of School Finance, Courtney Moran, Assistant Superintendent, Tom Clay, Chairman, Chairperson of the Select Board, and Jeff Morissette, Director of Land Use Management. We will also be tapping into other individuals to speak on certain articles. You may ask questions via the Q&A button in Zoom. We will take questions for each article as we are going along. I will do my best to monitor these questions, but I also request your patience as this is my first time in this role of uh, being this host. We love it to have your questions and it's not only a great way to learn more about each article, but to learn more about town meeting and how it works in general. And so for a short brief, I'll turn it over to Angela to talk a little bit about the um, upcoming town meeting logistics. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you so much. And thank you to the League for hosting this article year after year. It's so helpful to the voters. Town meeting is coming up, our special town meeting on uh, Monday, this coming Monday. Uh, it starts at 7 p.m. and it'll be held in the Westford Academy Gymnasium. Um, we need a quorum of 200 voters in order to get started. Um, and um, we don't think we'll have any problem getting that number we will be starting right on time. So I would advise people to try to get there a few minutes early to secure their parking and uh, check in with the tellers. Um, town meeting is our legislative form of government in Westford. The town meeting decides on and votes on and decides on uh, monetary issues and the laws that affect our day-to-day -day living here in Westford. So it's really important that people attend and vote uh, so that they can participate uh, in the governance of the community they live in. And I would really encourage people to do so. It's a fascinating process, and uh, you will feel as though you've accomplished something if you come to town meeting. Um, we only have nine articles. I don't expect the meeting to uh, be very long, uh, and I do think that it will probably move along quickly. So again, I hope people will come on time and um, uh, stay for the duration. If anyone has any questions, feel free to contact me through the town moderator's website, and I'll be happy to answer as many questions or give what information I can. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Um, I'm now going to turn the floor over to Kristen and Dan to run through the first few articles uh, as they relate to our town finances. Um, take it away. All Great. Right, Thank right. you very much. Um, my name is Kristen Lass. I'm the town manager. Uh, I will uh, defer article one to Dan O'Donnell, the finance director. He and I will mostly uh, ping pong article descriptions back and forth with a few other uh, guest viewers uh, into the play. So uh, I'll turn over article one to Dan. Great. So article one is to approve fiscal year 2024 budget appropriations. Uh, there's a four sections here. I'm just going to step through them quickly. Um, the first section is asking to raise and appropriate 215000 to supplement a couple budgets here. Uh, we need an additional 50000 for legal services for the FY24 budget. Um, we had originally reduced the 24 budget from 125000 to ninety. 
Uh, but that was before we knew that the fire hours bylaw uh, would be coming on and also before we knew about the MBTA multifamily uh, communities uh, article will be coming to the March town meeting. So we do need to supplement this to, uh, to pay for those legal services. And then of course we have $165,000 for recycling services. Uh, this is one of the most volatile budgets we have. Um, we, we pay a fee uh, per ton of recycling based on market conditions. And uh, as of August, the plastic market just collapsed. So we do need to supplement this to ensure recycling pickup services through the end of the fiscal year. The next section here is appropriating $950,000 from free cash uh, to the health insurance trust. Uh, this, the health insurance trust became partially self-insured uh, in March of 2022. Uh, since that time, we just have not run well. We've had a lot of large claims and uh, we actually finished FY23 with a negative fund balance of 387,000. So we do have to fund this uh, per mass general laws. Uh, this is adding some extra. Uh, the health insurance trust did just raise insurance rates for employees uh, by 15% back in September. Um, and that's to try to see if we can uh, cover the claims from here on out. But we will be monitoring this uh, expense from month to month very closely. And then after increasing 950, we're asking you to vote to decrease the debt service budget by $920,400. Uh, we had budgeted debt payments in here for both uh, 51 Main Street, the building that was supposed to be constructed there, and also for the J.B. Fletcher Library. Uh, we don't, we haven't borrowed any funds yet for those, for the library because we have the um, library commissioner's grant. So we, there's no need to borrow this year, which is great. So we are requesting to reduce that budget. And lastly, we're requesting to appropriate $60,000 from Stormar retained earnings. Uh, so you might know that there was a, a large sinkhole that opened up over on East Prescott Street in mid-September after one of those storms. And so it took an entire week to refix the, uh, the structures and repaid the road and the estimated expense is about $60,000 that came out of the budget. So we want to replenish the budget so they can uh, finish the, the rest of the things they need to do to, throughout the year. And that is article one. Um, I don't see any questions. Uh, so if there is none, we can move on to article two. So article two seeks to appropriate from free cash uh, a sum of $22,000 $565.66. Uh, as town meeting members may recall from March, the town of Westford uh, was involved in a, an opioid settlement agreement uh, in which we are now receiving those funds and will be receiving those funds for a period of 15 years. Uh, at every town meeting uh, with funds on account, we do need to appropriate them into a special account so they don't uh, go to free cash and could be used for any specific item. Um, once the town meeting, uh, if they choose to appropriate the funds to this settlement account, um, there is an opioid settlement uh, task force that works on my behalf for the town to recommend projects to the select board and the select board can authorize the funding. Uh, we've already used some of the funds uh, from the prior obligation uh, to fund some special programs and projects in the town. And again, I don't see any questions, so I think we can move on to Article 3. All right, Article 3 is to approve capital appropriations. And again, we have three different sections here. Um, the first one is appropriating funds from free cash. The first project is um, for the DPW uh, garage replacement of the uh, compressors there. They weren't working this past year and uh, they need to be replaced uh, before the uh, hot season gets back in. Then we have $200,000 for the police station attic and pipe insulation. Uh, basically, there's a, a lot of humidity and moisture in that attic there and uh, all the, the uh, insulation needs to be replaced and some piping removed and all that to make the system work again. Um, so the good news is the request for this was originally $300,000, but uh, Jeff Goodwin, our facility instructor, uh, worked with the quotes and we got the project down to 200,000. And lastly, we have the uh, engineering request for the Stony Brook Bridge resident relocation and right of way. So basically Mass DOT is coming in and they need to replace the, uh, the Stony Brook Bridge. It's a $2 million project. However, there's a resident that's located between the, the railroad bridge that is right next to it and the actual Stony Brook Bridge that needs to be re relocated under the Uniform Relocation Act. Um, we already requested $50,000 at the special town meeting and we will be requesting $100,000 at this town meeting. We're going to make a motion on the floor to reduce this after we uh, look more into the cost. 
Um, basically, what we need to pay for is consultants to help us with the relocation, uh, some temporary easements for the project. And then for the family being moved, we have to pay for their rent, moving expenses, legal expenses, utilities, and so on during the time that they're uh, removed from their house. The next section here is uh, a couple of water capital requests um, coming from water retained earnings. Uh, the first is for the Forge Village treatment plant repairs. Uh, filter three is actually having some issues and we have to go in and basically remove all the media and investigate what's causing the issues. And it's quite a labor intensive job. Uh, we wanna do this now. So uh, the project is up and running in time for watering season next spring. And then we have the uh, PFAS uh, facilities preliminary design. Um, we've been talking a lot about, about prefects for quite a while, um, but basically this is to, to do the design and have a survey of propo proposed facility sites, uh, developing initial permitting tables, uh, doing a geotechnical investigation, and developing some preliminary site plans for that project. Uh, the, the, um, the treatment plants are going to be located at the Forge Village plant and the Nutting Road treatment plant. And lastly, we have a, a bond issue here. We're requesting the authorization to issue bonds in the amount of a million dollars to pay for the rooftop units at the Blanchard Middle School. Um, these need to be ordered now in order to be ready for the, the summer uh, construction of the roof. Uh, we did approve uh, $6.5 million uh, as a debt exclusion back in March to, to replace this roof with the MSBA kicking in about $3 million of that cost. Um, this is the time to do it because the MSBA will pay for their share of taking down and replacing the new units for the installation, which will save us about $100,000. So this is a time-sensitive project. Okay. Um, once again, I do not see any questions for Article 3, so we can move on to Article 4. And a reminder, if anybody does think of a question, and we've already passed the article, I think it's okay to pop it into the Q&A and we can come back to it. So Article 4, we're asking to dismiss this. This is just a placeholder for my own peace of mind. Um, if for some reason Article 1 were to fail, we would need this article to apply one-time funds to balance the FY24 budget. Uh, the alternative would be to hold another special town meeting, which we don't want to do. So this is my request to be on the warrant. <laughs> okay. Article 5. All right, Article 5, we're just, this is basically a housekeeping item. Um, we're just asking you to unauthorize debt that's been authorized at previous town meetings. Unfortunately, these are not real dollars going back to the budget. Uh, these are just amounts that remain uh, that are authorized, and we just want to clean up our books. So we do this every five or six years uh, to lower our overall um, authorized debt number. Um, and uh, again, seeing no questions. Um, we're now moving on to Article 6. Article 6 is um, approval of a community preservation committee recommendation um, as it relates to uh, Drew Farmhouse. And for that, I'd like to introduce Ellen Hardy um, to speak on this subject. Thank you, Vicki, very much. I'm here representing the new nonprofit that's been established. Um, it is called the Drew Farmhouse Incorporated. And the reason that we created this organization, this nonprofit this past summer, was solely for the purpose of buying the former Coldwell Banker Real Estate Building, which is at 70 Boston Road in Western. Uh, many of you know this very familiar red farmhouse that's at the intersection of 495 and Boston Road. It was vacated by Coldwell Banker in December of 2021 and has been sitting vacant since then. And uh, my husband and I and several other people in Westford wondered what might happen to that. And it seemed to us a perfect location to uh, partner with the town for two goals that we share in common. And that is um, a, a wanting to preserve an historic building in Westford. The farmhouse was built in 1865. But more importantly, as a place that we could provide workforce affordable housing in the town. This is a term that is probably not familiar to many of us. And that's because it's a goal that the town has in the um, workforce, plan, the housing plan that we have just adopted within the last year. Workforce housing is one of the goals, the 13 goals of that plan. But to date, the town has not accomplished, has not been able to 
build or provide any of these. These are people in town who earn between 80% and 120% of what's called the area median income. This is all established by HUD, the Housing and Urban Development and our Affordable Housing Committee. Working with our Affordable Housing Committee, which we started doing just a year ago, they asked us to set the, the goals for this project as people who are earning between 80% and no more than 100% of the area mean income, and we're certainly willing to do that. So the public-private part of this is that the Drew Farmhouse Foundation uh, Nonprofit, Inc., will buy the farmhouse. We have um, had a, we've made an offer. We have signed a purchase and sale to purchase the property for $1.1 million. And that will be funded by a mortgage um, from the Enterprise Bank and Trust. And that will be, um, my husband and Mike and I will back that um, mortgage. And um, we also have lots of generous people from Westford who support this concept. So we have over $168,000 in pledges toward this uh, expense as well. But the other half of the project, which is to build out the apartments, that's what we're going to you as voters of Westford for um, on Monday night from the what's called the community preservation funds. These are money that comes out of our tax dollars. It's a surcharge on our property tax. Um, and it's set aside specifically for affordable housing, historic preservation, or open space. And we are asking to dip into two of those pots for this project. $1 million for the apartments to be built in the farmhouse and the balance of 450,000, which will allow us to maintain the historic architectural integrity of the property. And both of these will be in perpetuity. There will be deed restrictions on the property when we purchase it that says that's what it must be used for forever. So this could not be turned over and turned into something else. We're really excited about this. We've gotten permits from all of the town boards and committees that we have uh, gone to, Planning Board, Zoning Board of Appeals, Conservation Commission, unanimous support from all of those. And uh, the Finance Committee, the Affordable Housing Committee, the Historic Commission, and the Community Preservation Committee also have unanimously supported this. And this past Tuesday with four of the members of the board of uh, select board, I'll get that someday, um, sitting, it was a four to nothing vote to support it as well. So the end result will be that that property will always look as it does now. There will be five unit, living units there where people who no longer can afford to live in Westford can stay here. And the icing on the cake is that we are partnering with the local habitat which will create a three bedroom uh, habitat home in the barn, no cost to our nonprofit, no cost to the town. That's a habitat venture that just uh, is a wonderful addition to what we originally saw as just workforce housing, but now it's workforce housing and habitat. So we certainly hope that voters will come out on Monday night, ask any questions that you have, because this is a whole new world. Town meeting has never done workforce housing. And we've never partnered with a nonprofit to do it together in this way. So that's what we're proposing. And I'm more than willing to answer any questions that anyone has. Thank you so much for the chance to be here, Vicki. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, very nice, concise presentation. Um, and probably so good that right now I'm not seeing any questions. So um, as I said before, you know, if somebody thinks of something, we can always come back to this. Um, up until the end of the meeting, of course. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, let's move on to Article 7. Oh, oh hold on, hold on. I finally got a question. Um, okay. okay, so from uh, Christy Bates, what will happen to 70 Boston Road if town meeting doesn't fund it? Well, without town meeting funding, the Drew Farmhouse Inc. simply cannot do the project. We do not have the financial wherewithal to do the build out without public funds. So we will have to tell the owner of the property, which is anywhere real estate uh, in Madison, New Jersey, um, that we cannot complete the sale. There will be no closing on October uh, 27th. We will be out the money that we have already put into the project, which is 
um, or close to $100,000. And I presume the property will go back on the market and we'll see if someone else can come up with a viable solution for uh, what that property might be next. Uh, and we have another question uh, from Mary. I apologize if I butcher this, Cacciatore. Um, how will residents be selected for this workforce housing? Mm -hmm. Well, it will be the board of directors of the Drew Farmhouse, Inc., but we will be working very, very closely with the town's affordable housing committee. They will be our council. We are also guided by uh, the regulations established by HUD. So the income restrictions will be, uh, have, uh, which I've already mentioned, that will be our guideline. And we will simply do it on a, uh, as apartments become available, we will let it be known that there is an availability and people will submit applications just as they would for any other uh, apartment. And those will be evaluated by the uh, board of directors who will establish which ones are in fact eligible. And uh, they are only one bedroom apartments. They're not family apartments. Uh, four of them are one bedroom and one of them is two bedroom. Um, for that, this, so that is how the decisions will be made. Okay. Um, oh, another question from Peggy Huang. Uh, what portion of the current CPC funds does the 1.4 million represent? Roughly how yeah. much does the CPC fund increase annually? It's two, two questions, sorry. So what portion of the current funds does this represent? Dan probably is better at that than I will. Let me take a stab at it, Dan, and please correct me. Jesse Beyer, actually, the town accountant, covers this closely, but he and Dan um, know the numbers. Every year from the money that you and I pay as a surcharge, the town generates approximately $2 million. And the state doesn't match it 100% as they used to, but it's just under 50% that the state then gives us. So that's about $3 million a year coming in. A third of that must be set for aside for affordable housing, a third for open space, and a third for um, historic preservation. The other portion is goes into a general fund and the town meeting can appropriate it among those three pots, however they want. My understanding is there's currently about $7 million available total in that. So the $1 million would come out for affordable housing, and then the 450,000 would come out of the historic preservation. And Dan, if I'm completely wrong on those, please correct those figures. But those are the figures we've been given as I understand them from Jesse Barr, the town accountant. It's close, but um, what how the CPA operates is that they um, bank basically all the year's revenue and they, they use it for projects in a future year. So starting on July 1st, they had a balance of 5.3 million. So with the 1.4 uh, being appropriate, there's still a very healthy balance of about uh, 3.9 billion, which is higher than what we usually have. And one other thing is that the uh, the money is all coming out of, there are different sections of CPA, but it's all coming from undesignated. That's where the money has. Uh, the CPA tries to um, keep a maximum flexibility with the fund. So it is all coming from CPA funds. It's just a, a designated bucket, which is like their general fund. And it's not one third going to each of those categories for affordable housing. It's just ten percent for each of those must be allocated for the year. Thank you. So just a couple of clarifications. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. And, and Three million was right off. That and the second part of this question was how much does the CPC funds fund increases annually? How much does it increase annually? Like Ellen said, it's about three million dollars. Okay. Thank you. And um. Yep, so uh, there are no other questions right now with regard to Article 6. Uh, so let's move on to Article 7. Okay, um, Article 7 is uh, requesting to uh, amend the senior uh, means tested citizen, senior citizen property tax exemption. Uh, this is legislation that we worked on back in 2017 uh, for about a year. We brought to town meeting for approval in 2018 and uh, sent it on to uh, the state for approval, which took until 2021 to finally come back to us. Uh, but basically, the, the goal of this legislation is to make sure that uh, seniors who have lived in Western for over 10 years don't pay more than 10% of their income towards property taxes. 
um, the, the laws that exist now are pretty stringent. So if you miss it by a dollar, you're basically cut off. So this allows them some leeway uh, to be in more of a range than not. Um, so basically, we have to bring this back to October town meeting because there is a sunset clause to the current legislation. Uh, we're in uh, the set, the third year, actually. This year will be a third year, and this sunsets after three years. Um, so we do want to get this back to the uh, state legislature as quickly as possible. Uh, we are planning on either bringing this needs a ballot vote to be enacted as well after this town meeting vote. So once the state approves it, we'll go back to either the May election or November state election for approval. And that way we can uh, use this program in FY24. Um, just a couple things here. In FY22, the first year, we had 13 approved exemptions that totaled about $19,000. And then in FY23, we had 21 exemptions that totaled about $25,000. Uh, we were worried this would uh, basically um, you know, drive up uh, the, the taxes a little bit. So we did cap it at about $200,000 was our total, but we're not reaching as many people. They don't qualify. Uh, so there is one change to language in here that um, basically to qualify for this, your house and the current legislation has to be 80% of the median value in town. We want to change that and just make it hundred percent. And we think we can capture about 10 to 15 more families by doing so. So we'll probably see, you know, around 35, $40,000 in exemptions each year if that occurs. Um, and I'm seeing no questions, so let's move on to Article 8, and I believe for that we are going to speak with um, Jenny Lynn, Director of School Finance, and Courtney Moran, the Assistant Superintendent. Good evening. This is Courtney. Um, Jenny, do you want to speak, or would you like me to start? Uh, you can start. Okay, so Article 8 um, talks about the authorization of our school bus, our yellow bus contract. And at present, we are um, prohibited, we are allowed to um, enter into a contract for three years. What we're looking for is for the school committee to have the authority um, as the governing agency to um, authorize a, up to a five year contract or the ability to have a three year contract with a one year ad and another one year ad if necessary. So it does give a little bit of flexibility. It also um, will make our bid a little bit more attractive in knowing that we are looking, um, could potentially lo look up to five years for this con yellow bus contract. Jenny, do you wanna so, add anything? Sure. Uh, so as Courtney just mentioned, this article will grant school committee the authority to enter three years contract with two years extension. So this give us a more uh, cost effective way to negotiate a bus contract down, especially for the two extension years. So that's the main purpose of well, why we but we are putting this article uh, on a special town meeting. Any contract more than three years needs a town meeting authorization. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing any questions. Uh, so, our uh, I guess we can move on to Article Nine, uh, and for Article Nine. Um, I believe Jeff Morissette, our Director of Land Use Management, will be speaking to Article 9. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> uh, you are correct. So thank you very much for hosting. Um, so Article 9 proposes to amend the zoning bylaw to define and regulate firearm businesses separately from other uses. So with this amendment, any of the following would be considered a firearm business. So purchase or sale of firearms, ammunition, or firearm accessories, the operation of a firing range, or the performing of gunsmithing services. So this bylaw would also limit firearm businesses to the commercial highway and industrial highway zoning districts, which are generally located along Littleton Road, Liberty Way, and portions of Powers Road. It would require a special permit for new firearm businesses and designate the planning board as the special permit granting authority. Special permits provide greater discretion, allow the planning board to consider more criteria and impose certain conditions of approval. It would actively involve the Westwood Police Department as part of the planning board review process and would require applicants to submit a site-specific security operation and management plan for approval by the police department. 
This amendment would also require buffers between firearm businesses and certain established uses. So specifically, it would require a 1,000 foot buffer between firearm businesses and schools. And currently the only school that is either in or within a thousand feet of the commercial highway or industrial highway zoning districts is the Neshoba Valley Technical High School. There would also be a 500 foot buffer provided to child care centers, religious uses and locations where children commonly congregate to participate in scheduled and structured activities. And lastly, there would be a 500 foot separation distance between one firearm business to another firearm business. Additionally, there would be a limit on the total number of special permits the planning board could grant for firearm businesses to four. It would also limit the total number of special permits the planning board could grant for firearm dealers to two. And by firearm dealers, we mean firearm businesses that sell firearms, ammunition, or related accessories. So for an example, if you had a business that sold firearms, sold ammunition, performed gunsmithing services, and operated a firing range, that would count as one special permit toward the limit of two for firearm dealers and would count as one special permit towards the overall limit of four. If we took another example, you had a business that performed gunsmithing and operated a firing range that would count zero towards the firearm dealer limit of two and it would count once towards the overall limit of four. We take one last example, if you had two distinct firearm businesses at the same location, each would count separately towards the applicable limitations. So if at one site, say you had one firearm business and they subleased to another and each of them had a retail component, that would count as two towards the limit of two for firearm dealers. And then you would add up the rest for the towards the total limit of four if there were any others. So the two existing sportsman's clubs in town with firing ranges would not be negatively affected by this amendment and they would not count towards a limitation on the number of special permits. And then due to constitutional protections and evolving case law, it is very important that proposed regulations not be overly restricted. Therefore, there's language built into this proposed bylaw giving the planning board the opportunity to waive or reduce setback requirements and to waive either or both limitations on the number of special permits so as to prevent an effective prohibition on any of the considered elements of service for firearm businesses. The proposed limitations on the number of special permits for firearm dealers and firearm businesses were based on an evaluation of current licensing information from the Massachusetts Executive Office of Public Safety and Security. And when comparing the average number of licenses per community or Westford's per capita share, the plan board found that the suggested limit of two for firearm dealers and an overall limit of four for firearm businesses would not be unduly restrictive. And there's a lot more detailed information about some of that in the planning board's written report and recommendation. So in, let's see, in summary, while there's no such thing as a perfect bylaw, we believe that this proposal provides for reasonable regulations of firearm businesses. It would not be overly restrictive and it would involve the practical involvement of the police department throughout the planning board process. And it would allow realistic opportunities for the siting of firearm businesses, even when factoring in the proposed buffers and setbacks. The planning board voted 401 to support this amendment and the select board voted 400 to support the amendment. The planning board's written report and recommendation that I mentioned before is available on the town's website. We encourage anyone with questions to reach out to either me or town planner, Joe Jeffers. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'll pause for a minute just to see if we do have any questions coming in from our attendees. Um, but uh, while I do that pause, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, all the town officials and committee members and participants tonight for attending our special town meeting preview. Uh, I hope you found it as informational as I did. And, um, you know, we look forward to seeing you Monday night at um, Westford Academy at seven o'clock for a special town meeting. And as of yet, I'm still not seeing any questions. So um, with that, uh, oh, I, uh, yeah. um, oh, I do. First question, of course, as I'm about to pause, uh, what happens if this bylaw doesn't pass? So if this bylaw doesn't pass, 
uh, we will keep the status quo. So that would mean that uh, any firearm business coming in, it could be considered, depending on the specific business, as either a retail use, light manufacturing, or even indoor and outdoor commercial recreation. So as with the prior example from earlier this year, uh, that would likely require site plan review if it was considered a change in use. So um, some of you may be familiar with that, but essentially we would have the status quo and there would be no limitations uh, restricting other than the existing bylaw that's, that's in place. And site plan review, it's for uses that are allowed as of right and there would not be any setbacks or buffers or limits on the numbers. So you have what you have in place now. Okay, we have another question um, from Robert. Will the recording of this session be available? I missed the beginning. Yes, Robert, it will be available. West for Cat, and I would like to, th I missed that. Thank you a minute ago. I'd like to thank West for Cat for recording this uh, and broadcasting this. Uh, it is much appreciated, but yes, it will be available. Okay. <clears throat> and it looks like we have no more questions. So I will again repeat my thank you to everyone who attended, uh, to all the officials who made time this evening to participate. It certainly is helpful to uh, the voters to see this either tonight or uh, as Robert's going to do, view this vis-a-vis um, -vis the recording. Uh, and thank you and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone. Thank you, Vicki, so much. Thanks Thank for the week. Good night. Good night.